it's just hard found. <laughs> so we have to turn those hand mics off for her uh, lavalier mic to work. Can you hear me now? All right. Um, good evening. My name is Neva Hatsonen, and um, I'm here this evening to represent the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, which I've been a member of since its inception. Um, I also am an academic. I uh, have done and my scholarly work is in the area of contemporary food and agricultural systems. And uh, those of you who uh, have been around the block for a while might remember a thing called rural sociology. That's pretty much what I uh, study. Um, and in the time I've lived here in Missoula for the last 12 years, I have worked um, quite a bit with many Montana farmers and ranchers, helping them uh, you know, find new avenues for economic uh, opportunity uh, and work on our local food system in a variety of ways. I've sat around kitchen tables uh, on a lot of farms and ranches, and I've heard many of the kinds of things that folks said today about the economic um, challenges that agriculture faces, and I totally hear that. And I could talk to you, uh, silly, silly, uh, about um, why I think that's occurring in terms of um, how agriculture has developed historically in the United States, um, and what has, you know, what has led to that uh, problem. And yet, because I eat, how many people eat? Right? We all eat. Because I eat, I cannot say, ah, you know, I don't want to find solutions. We got to find some solutions. And that's really where uh, we're coming from. CFAC is incredibly grateful to the uh, planning board and to the uh, rural initiative staff and the county commissioners that have finally put this on the public agenda um, and really taking it seriously tonight. Um, as I walked in here, oh, I have to say I was a little nervous. But as I listened to all of you, I thought, you know, these are the people in my community. We can we can come up with solutions that work for all of us. And um, so I'm actually really excited uh, because this is a conversation that needs to happen. Missoula County has recognized this problem with the loss of agricultural land for over 30 years, and yet. The county has not done anything systematic to really um, address that issue when it comes to subdivisions. It's done a great job with the open space bond and voluntary conservation easements, but very little has happened. And so, um, as a result, uh, what's actually happened is we haven't done anything. And so what I'm going to tell you about tonight is a, a report that is based on data that I am a scientist, <laughs> I teach research methods, some of my students will tell you I'm kind of a stickler on some of that. And um, I, it is based on data, and it's uh, based on extensive research we did, as well as uh, input from a number of landowners and other experts in the area of food and agriculture in our community. I just want to credit Paul Hubbard, who's the first author on this report. He's moved on to go to business school, and start some local food businesses, um, but he's the first author and did a lot of the legwork on the research. Um, I won't be able to cover all of the material in the report. I brought along some summaries, um, and if folks would like copies, I'd send them up to the planning board, but you can also find them uh, on the Rural Initiatives website. They put them all up there. All right. Before I launch into the report, I want to um, briefly tell you about um, the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition. It was founded in 2005 in order to strengthen Missoula County's food system. Um, in other words, we try to work from field to plate. It's not, you know, some people think, oh, we're just about this land use issue. We're not. We're really interested in the whole system and how to strengthen it here locally because we are all eaters and um, we need to think about food and where it comes from and how it gets to us. We're a coalition, includes farmers and ranchers, um, 
It includes anti-hunger advocates, conservationists, nutritionists, uh, and a whole host of different folks who share this common interest in food and a common understanding that food is central to our lives. I mean, think about your families, the times you remember, right? There's times you remember you're around the table sharing a meal with people you love. Food ties us to one another. It also ties us to the land every day, whether we think about it or not. Um, it's one of the key ways we interact with the natural world. Um, our programs involve a range of approaches, such as uh, creating new markets and partnering with local food businesses, such as the Western Montana Growers Cooperative. Um, Landlink Montana is, as uh, Fred Stewart, I think was his name, mentioned, um, we need a clearinghouse that connects those who want to farm with those who have agricultural land and want to see it stay in agriculture and figure out some innovative tenure arrangements. Um, it's a really neat program, and uh, we'd be happy to tell you more about that. We are uh, promoting other kinds of markets for uh, local food. Um, the university where I work, we pioneered this. 20% of the $3.5 million budget that's spent on food every year uh, at the University of Montana is now coming from Montana. It's one of the top farm to cafeteria programs in the nation, and I'm really proud of it. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're trying to do, help new farmers get started. That's, we're, we're really trying to get it a holistic approach. Um, if you think about it, right, what, is, what does local government do? Right? Local government um, deals with all sorts of things, transportation, uh, water, um, air quality, schools, on and on. But we don't tend to do anything about food, and isn't that odd? I mean, and this is a really important public discussion that we need to have about food. And we've relegated food to the national level, to the federal government, to Washington, D.C., and to the World Trade Organization and international trade agreements. Right? Something as intimate as food that we put into our bodies every day, we've relegated to somebody else. So this is really a discussion about um, what is the role of local government in our food system. Um, and CFAC believes that local government and all of us have a responsibility to plan for agriculture. Did I wave away the mic? <laughs> what did I do? Can you hear me? No. no. I'm loud, I'll just talk. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Uh, Greg? Okay. Um, sure. Can't do my Bonnie Raid imitation now. Um, but. Uh, we also are really interested in how to do homegrown, literally homegrown economic development here. And food businesses are a part of that. Um, and it's farming related businesses. And so that's actually what got us into this issue of farmland was realizing, hey, we might be able to create markets for, oops, did I skip one? No, oh, that's okay. Uh, what got us into this issue of looking at farmland was, we could create markets like at the University of Montana for local food, but you know what? The University of Montana would buy more local food if it was available. We realized we can't serve those markets. We need more farmers. We need to be sure that we have farmland. And that's really why we're in this sort of painful land use issue, right? Why would I care about this issue? I should do something, I could just go teach, right? But instead, um, we got into this because we realized without farmers and without farmland, there is no local food system. Um, and there's no security when it comes to our future. Um, we're proud of our consistent effort over the years to bring this issue to light um, and to shape this conversation and influence the conversation that's happening now. Um, we also are very open to sharing different ideas and coming up with solutions that work for a variety of folks. Um, we're not gonna fall on our swords over anything, but I wanna share with you, um, I'm not gonna even read all of this, but these are the central questions that we looked at in order to study what was going on here in terms of food and agriculture in Missoula County. So what's the state of agriculture here? How has it changed over time? Oh boy. Uh, it's, too much uh, popping off here. <laughs> uh, you know, where are our best soils? What can we learn from recent subdivision decisions? 
Um, and how much land, grazing and cropland remain? How can the community effectively keep working farms and ranches productive and build a more vibrant local food system? Ag economics, uh, one of my favorite topics. We have about 700 um, farms in Missoula County now, and we can talk a lot about that, but what we know is that $7.6 million worth of agricultural product is generated here. We're not the bit, you know, the most uh, productive, you know, economically uh, agricultural county in the state. But we do know that county residents spend $300 million on food each year. Um, and we have, uh, the UFDA has finally started actually tracking direct sales to consumers when farmers report in their, consen their census uh, reports, um, we see an 84% increase in the number of farmers selling directly in just a 10 year period in the county. Almost $200 increase in terms of the number of dollars spent locally. That's, you know, five years ago, they'll, they'll do another one this year. What if we doubled it, right? Right now about 10% of our food that we eat comes locally. What if we doubled it to 20% or 30%? What, how much more money could we circulate in our community? Um, that's part of what this is about. This is a national trend, um, as you all probably know. Um, the USDA found, in, uh, much to the shock of ag economists, in 2011, that local food uh, sold direct to consumer or through intermediated channels, right? So through one step, like, like the growers co-op, through a grocer. Um, is now generating, as of 2008, $4.8 billion. That's a lot of change. Um, okay, um, but this isn't just about keeping land, uh, keeping money circulating locally. It's about community. It's about security in the long term. There's actually a lot at stake. Um, in many ways, as you know, our heritage is rooted in the land. Um, in our farms and ranches, and so I would suggest is our future. Um, the qual we have quality soil is much underappreciated, um, yet they're absolutely vital to human survival. Everything we did today, we had energy, we took energy into our bodies, we did it because we ate something that grew in dirt, right? Um, farms are also important for water quality, flood control, as some of the folks who live out in Target Range about the floods last year. Um, wildlife habitat, 50 years from now, we don't know what's going to be happening in this world, right? We don't know. But we do know we're going to have to eat. And we don't know what the future will bring. We've got a lot of uncertainties about uh, the, the availability of oil into the future, uh, population, we're expected to be at 9 billion um, by 2050. We're going to have to produce 70% more food in the world to meet the needs of the people by then. Um, so, and yet 25% of the land in the world is already degraded. Okay, I probably, where's Ginny, she Two knows. minutes. Oh, go have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> These These you all know I never drink with my client. <laughs> okay, agricultural land. There's different types of agricultural land. Um, they're shown on this map here for Missoula County. Only 8% of the land base in the county is agricultural soil. How much of it's gone? Actually, nobody knew until we started looking at this. And you know, we did the best we could using data <laughs> to answer this question. I can talk more about what these soils mean and such if folks want to later. But um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service soil scientist um, found that 80% of the lands containing the very best agricultural soils have been subdivided into parcels less than 40 acres. So if you take the very best of our agricultural soils, 80% of them have already been chopped up into 40 acre or less parcels, okay? Um, so that's pretty compelling. Another way to look at this data, because was to look at the Department of Revenue, and you know, as we all know, uh, agricultural land is taxed at a lower rate. So the Department of Revenue has an incentive, if you will, to be sure that 
you know, wherever the guy is who's growing apples, is really growing apples if he's claiming it for um, <coughs> agricultural taxation. So they, they actually have the, some of the best data. We, what we did was we took a three-year average for the period in 86 to 88, and we did that because it gets rid of what you call the noise in the, in the statistics in case you had some you know, strange thing happen a particular year. So we took the average in that three-year period, the average in the, uh, the mid-2000s, because um, that was the data that were available. What we saw was a change in our county of lost almost 29,000 acres of agricultural land or 1,400 acres converted per year on average. Um, the census of agriculture shows a similar kind of thing, but you can only get this by looking at harvested cropland. And I, I'll, uh, I can explain that later if we need to, because I do want to, can I beg you for two minutes? Two minutes, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to okay. explain a proposal we've got and why we got it, okay? okay. So, um, or, I'm hoping that folks are familiar with the process of subdivision review. What it is, is if you go in, you want to, say you want to divide your land. All that a subdivision is, is taking a piece of land and saying, I want to cut it into two parcels, or three, or 50, or whatever, right? That's what subdivision is, is to make them into different parcels. The state of Montana says that when you, when you want to do that, you have to go through a review process and certain criteria have to be looked at. Well, what are you gonna do about roads? What are you gonna do about sewer? What are you gonna do about um, sidewalks, right? Or are you close enough to schools? Those kinds of things, right? And they say that you need to review it for the impacts to agriculture and the impacts to agricultural water. Okay, and that's a critical piece because yeah, it's hard to farm without water here. Um, so, um, what's happened though is for decades and decades, as this earlier slide showed, is that that's never been considered. Okay, and so in, when we started to raise questions about this, we were asked to. Um, uh, to begin to review subdivisions for their impacts to agriculture, because a lot they didn't have the expertise um, locally to do that. And we would go out to the sites, we'd study the soils, and we'd comment. Okay, we've commented on 30 since 2008. Um, unlike one of the comments earlier, we do we have recommended um, denial in some cases. We have recommended um, that the, the subdivision would have no no real impact to agriculture, and so we weren't concerned about it. In other cases, we've made suggestions for modifications that have been adopted. Um, so it's been a it's been a process and a learning one for us. And that our knowledge of this issue comes from those experiences. Um, and believe me, the smoke has been hard. I've been there. Um, what we know about subdivisions in Missoula County is when those lands are being divided up for residences, we are seeing a much greater residential footprint than historically. In other words, you know, we're getting what my friend Paul likes to say is, you know, land that is uh, too big to mow, but, you know, too small to hay or whatever. I forget what he said. Uh, too small to farm, too big to mow. Okay. Um, so new residential lots on average are 2.7 acres. Um, that's over five times the size of the lots in, uh, the, in 1970. The land development patterns are inefficient, actually, right? Um, and they're problematic. Okay, we have commented on a number of different proposals in the two-year period from 2008 to 2009. 13 subdivisions on the most viable but buildable ag lands. Um, we saw that you know, 350 acres went to houses and about uh, 60 acres uh, were left for ag as a result of our input. Um, this, can be, this is doable, folks, okay? A lot of the farmland that's being subdivided is um, out in the Grass Valley and uh, here, you know, here in the valley, not much less up Potomac Way and so on. Um, so, the proposals. Here they are. 
And I'll just go through them quickly, and I'll let you fire questions at me if you want later. Oh, maybe we're not going to do no, that. No, later. I mean, whatever. Okay. Uh, where you can, you yeah, can get me out of party. Uh, okay, so here's the basic idea. Let's create agricultural cornerstones, or whatever we want to call them. But let's identify where are the lands that we really believe are should be priorities for, for agriculture. We're not not all of a, not all the ag lands maybe, but one, which ones are, do we care about the most? Do they make sense? Where is agriculture contiguous? Right? Where do you have lots of agriculture occurring in the same area so that services can be uh, uh, you know available in those areas? And then um, the next idea is to um, create policies that would protect a critical mass of farmland for the future. Um, not all of it. This is not about you know protecting every last acre. Although my friend Jim Cusker might <laughs> say, hey, uh, you know that would be nice. <laughs> but we know that's not realistic. Um, but what we'd like to see happen is okay. If we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna develop agricultural land, right? If you come in with your proposal, you want to develop it. Um, for every acre of quality soil that's lost, we're proposing that we protect an equal, you know, acreage of equal quality. Now that doesn't have to be on the site, okay, despite what some people are saying. It doesn't have to be on the site. It might be off-site. Maybe we, we incentivize protection into these agricultural cornerstones. Right, makes sense. So you're paying landowners elsewhere to keep their land in agriculture because they want it to be. Um, we, might, you might, in some cases, you might design a subdivision in a way that is um, that is includes agriculture as part of it. Some people are calling this agroverbia. I don't know about that, but you know, it's like um, people value agriculture. Could we design subdivisions in such a way that they would protect part of the land and develop part of it? Um, our goal is to provide flexibility, to encourage innovative design, to create predictable processes for developers. Um, I can say a lot more about how this might work if people want to ask about it later. Um, but let me just and wrap Riva, up. I'm, I'm not trying to. I'm done. No, I'm done. Well, um, we just have three other. I just want to honor the three other reports. Um, so I'm good. I will tell you later if you want to ask me about a subdivision where this worked through voluntary collaboration between the developer and landowners and the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition and Audubon Society. Um, because this is, our, we already have ways of doing this when people are you know, motivated to do it. So we'll talk about that later if you want. Um, we need to plan for agriculture. And ultimately, the, dis the question we have is do we want to keep agriculture in our future or do we want to keep losing ground? That is our message. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. I apologize. of it. Um, I'm here to present today a place to grow, which is 
a study that we commissioned when we started having these discussions about preserving agricultural land in Missoula County. We thought it was really important, just like Larry said, we need to have this conversation based on fact. Not fear, not intimidation, not emotion, not a dream, but based on fact. What really can we look forward to? So the gentleman that we had actually if you move that thing around to your backside or whatever you would be better? All right, you're an expert. I like it. Thank you. Um, that did not help. That was lies. <laughs> okay, I was just touching it. Um, so the gentleman that we had actually commissioned the report was Dr. Elon Gilbert. Elon has had over 45 years of experience in agricultural research. He's worked both locally and he's worked on an international scale for USAID. He's done a ton as far as agricultural development goes in both underdeveloped areas and areas just like Missoula. Um, he also has a degree, a PhD, from Stanford in applied economics, so he really understands what makes sense. We learned a lot from him, and we hope that you do too. If you'd like to see the report, go to MissoulaRealEstate.com. It's available there in PDF. You can download it. We'd be happy to share that information with anybody. So one of the really big goals of our report was to talk about um, what makes agriculture feasible in Missoula County. Um, and then let's look at a couple of scenarios. Do we have enough land to feed the people that are here in the case that someday we need to support ourselves? What's kind of interesting, and I think what a lot of people maybe don't think, is that we actually believe in a lot of the stuff that CFAC does. We believe that having students get locally grown food is fantastic. We believe that providing farmers who want to farm with land, linking them, what a great way to use the land that we already have. But where we really differ and where we've never been able to see eye to eye is the issue of subdivision. Subdivision is not the place to talk about agricultural preservation. It's just not. You're, if you're talking about subdivision, you're talking about one acre, two acres, five acres, maybe 20 on a huge subdivision. But in order for it to be a viable agricultural operation, I mean, Neva herself just said that, Neva herself just said, there's nothing I can do. I'm gonna fix it, I'm just Yeah, I'm just gonna uh, we're just gonna switch. I mean, she herself mentioned that 40 acres or less has created a huge problem in these subdivisions. So one or two or five acres at a time isn't really gonna do what we need it to do if we're talking about agricultural preservation. She also gave me a really quick idea, and I just totally forgot to do this. How many people here live in houses or apartments? <laughs> Everybody. Housing is important. We can't forget that. So anyways, we need to get back. So some of our general beliefs are, first of all, that we need to stop looking at local like it ends at the Missoula County border. In our report, we looked at a number of different resources that said that local was five miles away. Some of them said it was five miles or 500 miles away. One of them said it was a, what you could go in a truck, a delivery truck, that was called local. But it's not just about Missoula County. And I'll show you the map real quick. We, in our study, we said 100 miles. We thought that was a good middle number. And it was significant. Also, in our community, we need to look at growth that makes sense. Environmentally, financially, and for the, the social good of our community. People want to live here. It's quality of life. And then we also need to look at the fact that Preserving agriculture, we need to be realistic. It's not about a survival fear mode. It's just not. The, the fear-based arguments aren't, they're just not valid. It's just, we're not gonna get there. So we can make plans to increase food production, we can do all those things, but we need to have it based on fact, not on fear. And then finally, we want uh, consistent, fair, and enforceable regulations, and that's the most important thing. And we don't believe that subdivision has the capability of providing consistent, fair, and enforceable regulations. So, this is 100 miles from Missoula. Kind of shocking. It includes all of Flathead Lake, 
Helena, Butte, almost all the way to Great Falls. That's our local food chef. Thousands of acres of land that can be grown, food that can be provided to us. I love flathead cherries. I consider them local. They're not made in Missoula County. We talk about Montana beef. Of course, we have farms locally, but a huge portion of our beef is produced in eastern Montana. It's Montana beef. It's local. It's nowhere near, near Missoula County. We love that little truck that comes in at the farmer's market. They're always in that corner serving up some melons. Dixon is not in Missoula County. It's outside Missoula County. We need a broader perspective. And then finally, Cut Bank has, of course, the meat. In, in our study, we looked at three different counties, Lake, Missoula, and Valley. In that area, we had 463,000 acres of agricultural land. Now, that included all of the different types. 100,000 acres of that was prime or private irrigated. We're not talking about this huge issue where we're running out of land. The land is there. So like I said, we have enough land. We also wanted to look at what happens in 2030. So 2030 comes along, we've been growing, we've had people, we haven't actually, uh, you know, things have just been moving along. Do we have enough land to sustain us? Well, according to our report, we would need approximately 40,000 acres of land to sustain a vegetarian diet. Beef kind of goes on a different line because you need different resources. But a vegetarian diet that we can live on if that emergency came. We have in Missoula County alone 130,000 acres. We're, we're doing okay. And um, the, 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 I think the most important part is, you know, we've got to stop, we've got to get beyond the fear, basically. Another, another really, really, really big part, and I think you hit on it perfectly, we're, we're not talking, Missoula County gets good precipitation. But only 40% of that precipitation actually happens during the growing season. So that actually really limits what we can grow. It limits how much we can produce. And at the end of the day, it really can create problems when there's any sort of fluctuation in that particular um, strain. And we, we, know that, we know that there is water. We have rivers. But we're a closed basin. Water rights are not just given to people. They're incredibly expensive. They're not free, they're hard to get, they're impossible to get, actually. It's not just about, oh, well, we see the land in the, or the water in the river, therefore it can be put into irrigation. It's just not the case. We also know that climate change is happening. That's gonna lead to hotter summers, probably less rain, and at the end of the day, lower crop yields. We need to be realistic that Missoula County is not necessarily built to have a huge agricultural economy. That doesn't mean that we can't have truck farms, and that doesn't mean that there aren't farms that are working today, but it means that we cannot build our economy around something that is not feasible. And we need to plan on the fact that at some point we are going to be bringing food in. It's just what we have to do. If we want to make it, if we want to make it happen, if we want to make it um, feasible, we need to, as a community, put significant investments into soils and irrigation. Significant. Food production. I mean, what happens when the, the crops have been grown and there's, you know, farmers markets are done? There's no, where is there to put the food? We need to think about that. All right, now hand it off to Austin. He'll talk about a little bit of economics. Thanks. All right. When we talk about planning of what we should do in the future, then we obviously have to look at the past. So I point out the Missoula reflects actually the national trend of agrarian economics. We see a globalization across the entire world of market forces, a globalization of trade, um, a globalization that's kind of moved for less of a uh, family farm and more towards a part time, as numerous people have expressed, subsidized income farm uh, that. that that you have to work a full-time job at the same time in order to be able to afford, or that continues to do so simply by the love of actual farming, and not because of the actual ability to succeed in the market. Um, 
So as, as we point out, only 1% of the annual payroll in Missoula County came from agriculture in 2007. And when we look at the fear tactics of pointing out what it was in the past in comparison to what it is now, it's not due to the fact that, we, that, that something happened in Missoula County, but because other counties, including Eastern Montana, have better economies of scale and a competitive advantage to be able to outcompete us within that economic market. Just like our mountains and our topography is able to outcompete and have a competitive advantage on them um, within within Missoula County, so uh, it, it moves within the trend and it also s sticks within the plan. Uh, Uh, so, uh, outside of looking for more of the past, now we have to look for a little bit toward the future. So, if we are going to dive into those types of fears or those types of things that we need to look forward into the future, future in order to make a plan, um, then let's look at two major things. So, we have, in one case, complete economic cat catastrophe, uh, where some si situation forces Missoula County to be able to completely rely on a local food system. Now, uh, if this was to occur, um, then uh, we might see that we might see impact from uh, uh, climate change into it in, into which uh, agricultural technology and, uh, and other areas that have that competitive advantage would be able to have a greater competitive advantage um, which we would once uh, once again have to rely on outside market foods um, to, to our local food system it could be able to do so um, but it would be cheaper and, more, and less expensive to be able to use the market where we could actually invest in our local food system um, and be able to keep them more so afloat um, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next kind of segment, uh, we also look towards a, a transportational end of an economic catastrophe uh, where we talk of, of if that was to be the case, how would we be able to transport, transport uh, food into Missoula County in order to pay for it in, instead of being able to use our local food system. And uh, as I point out, it's more expensive to actually transport people than the actual aspect of food. Um, so it, it, the, the better economics of it is to actually use our competitive advantage and use our economies of scale to be able to plan for kind of an economic prosperity to where we can use Missoula's uh, land that's preserved for that agriculture remedy, but while simultaneously looking at the actual better business of Missoula um, to where we can invest in our local food system at the same time be sustainable and, and cost, cost effective. So, um, the, the really big question that we always ask ourselves is, what's the problem? Um, are we out of land? No, we're not out of land. Um, so, what are we trying to solve here? Uh, I get that there is a there is people who want this kind of lifestyle, and that is admirable. I respect those people who want to get up and work that hard every single day. That's tough, but that conversation can focus on something else besides subdivision. It can focus on open land money. That money was created for that. The community said, this is what we want. So let's build on that. There's conservation dollars out there. Those are the places where this kind of conservation is meant to happen, not in subdivision where you take a man's land or a woman's land, of course. We also need to plan for people. Missoula is beautiful. Um, He's from you, I'm from Missoula. We were lucky enough to live here, but I'm guessing a lot of you actually came here. So we need to leave that opportunity for other people to love Missoula as much as we do. And if we do create a policy that says that agriculture needs to be a key economic priority for Missoula County, we need to be willing to invest significantly in irrigation, in water rights, in food processing, and of course the land itself, all of that. And then above all, no matter what happens, the regulations need to be clear, concise, and consistent. What I get, you get, and that's across the board. So I just wanna end on this one thing. We cannot sacrifice those who are producing agriculture today for the dreams of those who wanna produce it tomorrow. It cannot happen. Thank you very much for the time, I appreciate it.
I'm Jim Tusker. I live on the uh, working ranch that I grew up on. And, uh, you, need use the mic? Mic, Jim. Yeah. you need it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm Jim Tusker. Okay. No? No. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Jim Tusker. Uh, I live on the working ranch that I grew up on. It's a family ranch that, uh, that has uh, been in the family for the past uh, 74 years. Uh, this is in uh, the upper part of Grass Valley. As indicated by uh, the title slide that you uh, see on the screen right now, uh, this report was prepared by the Open Lands Committee to provide information concerning uh, potential policies to preserve agriculture in Missoula County. Um, <clears throat> the Open Lands Committee is an advisory committee to uh, the commissioners on issues relating to the protection and preservation of open space, including agricultural land in Missoula County. The members represent uh, rural communities uh, within Missoula County, uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I'm a member of that committee. OLC holds uh, monthly meetings, uh, which are advertised and open to the public. Concerned with the lack of current uh, county policies, the commissioners asked the Open Lands Committee to review policies in existence here and elsewhere, which might lessen the impacts of development on the county's remaining agricultural land. The first request given to us by the commissioners uh, was for uh, our committee to compare and contrast the two reports uh, of which you have uh, just heard. Um, and we were also asked uh, to uh, furnish commissioners uh, with that uh, comparison report uh, that was done of June this past year. The Open Lands Committee also listened to the presentations uh, prepared by the uh, UM Law School Land Use Clinic. Um, we studied and uh, discussed that report in detail, and you will have an opportunity in just a moment, as soon as I'm through, uh, to hear uh, that report. An OLC subcommittee was uh, assigned the task of researching practices from elsewhere which are currently in use to protect agricultural land. The initial subcommittee report found that most successful ag protection programs use a combination of incentive-based and regulatory approaches. The best option is uh, for incentives. Use a variety of programs to meet the diverse needs of landowners. The best option uh, for uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory programs uh, provide and apply clear mitigation guidelines. The subcommittee was then uh, assigned the task to develop drafts of landowner uh, conservation uh, incentives and also to take a look at mitigation principles that might be used. Good. The full committee review consisted of uh, thorough and often rather lengthy uh, discussions, uh, which resulted in the modification of the draft documents that were submitted by the, uh, the subcommittee. This occurred during the uh, regular Open Lands Committee meetings over the course of a year. Uh, several of the meetings were well attended by the public. Final drafts of these uh, informational documents were forwarded without recommendation uh, to the commissioners for their consideration. The remainder of this presentation is a brief summary of the contents of the two reports. The numbering of options on the slides corresponds to the same system used in the documents which contain uh, much greater detail. The purpose of land owner conservation incentives is to review programs that provide uh, landowners uh, with incentives to protect agricultural land. In so doing, a variety of strategies are presented uh, to provide alternatives to best meet the needs of individual landowners. 
the steps taken by Missoula County to incentivize agriculture uh, are also suggested in the report. Now, some of these incentives that uh, were uh, reviewed are already in place and others are not. County funding is currently available for some programs. Uh, others would require additional revenue sources. Listed here are incentive programs which permanently protect agricultural land. Landowners using conservation easements retain complete ownership and control of their land. The land remains on the county tax rolls. These agreements are individually tailored to meet the needs of the owners. Landowners taking donated easements on their land receive income and estate tax breaks. Open space bond funds can be used to reimburse the donor for closing costs and stewardship fees. In purchase conservation easement, landowners receive the cash value of the conservation easement, and open space bond money is commonly used here. If stewardship practices similar to those provided by conservation easements are put in place, Open space bond money could be used to reimburse the landowners for protecting a portion of their property using deed restrictions. Land acquisitions allow the owner to be paid full market value for their property. Buyer retained ownership acquisitions typically involves the purchase of ag land by local government which then leases it to provide a county income. Fee acquisitions, however, can be followed by the buyer placing the property in conservation easement subsequent to the bargain sale to a conservation buyer. An open space bond funds could be used here. Here are some tax incentives. And I hope that if I say here is something that doesn't appear on the screen, you'll let me know. There are some tax incentives designed to uh, favor the continuation of agriculture. Of course, the preferential property uh, tax assessment and land valuation on agricultural land presently being used uh, should be continued. Further reduction of property tax rates on agricultural land by means of a long-term contractual agreement to forego development may appeal to landowners reluctant to embrace the perpetuity, the perpetuity concept of conservation easements. Additional lowering of property taxes could be put in place uh, when owners place their land in a conservation easement. Circuit breaker property tax programs operate when local taxes become excessive and automatically lowers taxes for, uh, for agricultural operators. This sounds pretty good, but it would require legislative action. County agricultural support measures would assist farmers and ranchers to better market their products, providing them with economic incentives for them to stay on the land. And in so doing, the county uh, could do a number of things. One would be, uh, and, and very easily done, pass a right to farm ordinance of which requires the notification of purchasers of, of residences adjacent to farms about the potential nuisances associated with agriculture. The county could create a local foods board to establish a sourcing program to best utilize local foods. The county could also uh, uh, provide individualized uh, support services uh, to farmers and ranchers uh, such as subsidized loans and estate planning. Another thing the county might consider would be uh, to grow and provide infrastructure for such things as agritourism, uh, on-farm sale products, farmers markets, and on-farm uh, hunting and fishing. And lastly, the county could provide incentives with tax breaks to establish businesses uh, such as local slaughter and meat facilities, uh, mobile meat processing plants and food processing plants. Incidentally, when I was a kid, there were a lot of those things here in the Sioux County. Incentives to protect agricultural land during development. 
Now, even with landowner incentives in place, some development of agricultural land will continue. These voluntary incentives used by the developer may reduce or offset the need for mitigation requirements. The, uh, the first of these, uh, voluntary transfer of uh, development rights, or TDRs. Now this action could shift development away from agricultural lands. Agricultural plan developments may include such things as clustering and the designation of agricultural open space. And finally, the county could use a variety of developer perks to encourage landowners to protect ag land during development. Density bonuses would be an example here. We now turn to the, uh, the second uh, document, Mitigation Principles and Guidelines. Uh, this was prepared with the recognition that even if all of the proposed incentives were put in place and heavily utilized, requests for subdividing agricultural land would probably still continue. Tim, I hold my five minutes up. You, oh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, the purpose of this document is to provide potential options to policymakers and the public about how to uh, lessen or offset impacts on agriculture caused by land development in Missoula County. It is hoped that these guidelines may be useful in crafting a potential mitigation policy applicable to uh, all subdivision projects. The following guidelines that were reviewed and forwarded uh, to the commissioners are listed as follow. Uh, the first of these, if adopted, mitigation policies should be stated in the Missoula Growth Policy and Subdivision Review Regulations providing landowners and developers with clear guidelines uh, in uh, crafting subdivision proposals. Mitigation should occur prior to or concurrent with the impact, uh, and allowing some flexibility for possible financial limitations of landowners. As a part of all approved subdivisions, permanent on-site buffers should be developed to minimize impacts of the project on adjacent ag operations. If mitigation land is protected by a conservation easement, it should be held by an organization with an established track record of stewardship, having endowments dedicated to the administration of and the annual monitoring of permanent easements. Mitigation requirements and should identify and use an appropriate classification system to ensure that like resources are protected on mitigated land. The NRCS classification of soils would be a typical example. Mitigation ratios refer to the acreage ratio of protected to developed land. A variable mitigation ratio based system should be created to discourage impact to high value resources. This system should apply to both on-site and off-site mitigation. The specific ratio that would be used in any project should be applied according to the value of the resource being protected. It was found that in jurisdictions with this system in place, one to one is the minimum mitigation ratio used. Listed here are some incentive program. <laughs> Wrong sheet, sorry about that. Uh, mitigation and land accessibility. All mitigation land must be readily accessible in a usable configuration uh, for the resource being protected. This guideline avoids the fragmentation of mitigated land and maximizes the future use of the ag resources thus protected. Mitigation requirements should include permanent equivalent water resources on mitigation land to support the intended mitigation goal. And similar to conservation easement, a deed restriction should provide that the protected land would, be, would permanently remain agriculture. If home sites are permitted on the mitigated land, 
The number and location should be designated in the mitigation agreement and not be counted as mitigation acreage. Previous encumbrances should generally not be permitted as mitigation for current or future subdivisions, uh, but could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The stacking of natural resource mitigation and agricultural mitigation should be avoided to prevent possible conflicts between the enforcement of multiple conservation purposes. In lieu mitigation fees, These could be levered by the commissioners when other mitigation options are not available. The amount of the mitigation fee should be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. All such fees collected should be used in Missoula County to conserve agricultural land. In summary, many, resource, uh, many reference resources were consulted in the preparation of the reports. In preparing the reports, uh, we found some options that we did not feel were applicable to Missoula County, and these were omitted by the committee uh, by consensus. Public comments were received and recorded. The final OLC reports include and considered natural resources in addition to agriculture. The final informational documents were forward without recommendation to the commissioners. And I'll conclude this brief report by thanking my fellow members of the Open Lands Committee for the huge amount of time that they committed to attempt to answer the request of the commissioners and in completing the assignments given them by the commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is focus on the, the role of law in the question that um, the planning board has before it and the planning board's unique role in the question as well. So uh, I want to hit on four main points. One is what the law has to say about the duty of the county to protect agriculture and its authority to do that. Um, I want to emphasize, as others have, the important role that planning plays in this process. We can't really skip over it. It's a significant foundation to whatever regulations um, and incentives actually get adopted. So the planning is the first step. Then we'll touch on agricultural mitigation during subdivision review because the law has something to say about that. Um, and I'll probably not talk a lot about incentives because um, those have been covered pretty thoroughly. So at the beginning, we want um, to focus on the planning board because that's the board that has us here this evening. And they have um, a unique role in a couple of ways. One is that they are the body that recommends language, 
growth policy language. And um, the growth policy document um, in the mind of the Montana legislature is an important place for dealing with agriculture, both mitigation and incentives. And then again, in subdivision review, we have the planning board conducting the hearings and doing the first uh, level of review of the subdivision documents. So the board uh, plays a very fundamental role, and I think it makes sense that you're the one that is having this particular session. Um, so we start with uh, our state constitution, actually, as a starting place for uh, in instructions on what we should be doing with agriculture. And we, as all of you know, have a very special constitution. It's one of um, one that's talked a lot about nationwide. And in it, it actually has a charge to the legislature that when it passes laws that affect agriculture, those laws should not only protect but enhance and develop agriculture. So that's in our state constitution. So when we see a law get passed, that affects agriculture, the legislature has to figure out um, how do we use this law to protect, enhance, and develop. It informs the way we interpret all of the statutes that the legislature passes. There are a variety of statutes um, of involving agriculture from, excuse me, from child labor laws to conservation district laws to tax laws. They're all throughout the code. But a couple of them deal with land use. And what the legislature has done is delegated to each county a responsibility to deal with ag and land use. So it's been delegated to the county. The county can't um, ignore what the legislature has delegated to it. So in the growth policy statute, the county is supposed to think about how development will impact ag lands and ag production and come up with measures, techniques, and incentives to help avoid, significantly reduce, or mitigate the impacts. So that's the place where it starts. And then in subdivision, um, at a minimum, there needs to be a review of impacts on agriculture. So it, um, under the law, it's part of the analysis. But subdivision, as we all know, is just one piece. And at the end of the day, um, the law is just one piece, right? The law can only do so much. So a lot of the incentives that um, have been suggested tonight um, and the community support and the communities um, stepping forward to protect egg, that has to happen um, as a complement to the law, but the law won't do it all on its own. So in planning, I, I think a lot of these ideas have already come up, but the one thing I would highlight in the planning um, is, let's see, I thought I skipped one, there we go. Um, so one of the big questions that our clinic was asked to answer is what, when, when those statutes we just talked about use the word agriculture, what do they mean? And that question's even come up tonight. There are all kinds of farming, there's, and then there's the production of livestock. And what the Montana Supreme Court has said is that agriculture is to be read very broadly. And our, our report, if you looked at it online, would go through the different ways that we came up with the definition of agriculture under Montana law. But if you look throughout the Montana Code and at Supreme Court decisions, what it says is it's not only the land, but it's what's happening on the land that needs to be protected, as well as to market and the overall economy. So each county in the state of Montana has to think about these things when they look at planning their land use and reviewing subdivision. Okay, so if we look at the planning, one thing that our clinic noticed when we looked around the country at different uh, planning documents is that a lot of them factored in things and did studies of things um, a little more broadly than what Missoula County has done so far. You've, the county has done the place-based project and inventoried soils, but a lot of communities around the country have looked at other things, many of which have come up tonight from all of you, like what are our food supply needs, um, what land is good for farming versus grazing, uh, what is the water supply to these particular pieces of land, 
What is the infrastructure? Can we get goods and services in and out? Connectivity to other lands. Um, what quantity and quality of replacement lands are available? Looking at marketing and then all those support opportunities. So the, I think there's a potential to build on the place-based project and inventory some of these other types of data as well to get a more robust picture of um, what are the critical lands um, to our community. The next question we were asked to look at is what uh, different places are doing as far as um, mitigation. So during that subdivision review process, what are particular places doing to offset the impacts that they see um, to the agricultural community? And here I think a lot of these ideas have already come up. But one thing that's important, when we saw these different ratios being used um, in different communities. I think one thing that's important to emphasize is that um, the landowners who had to protect land when they developed land didn't have to um, give land in fee simple. It was typically done with a conservation easement. So if a certain number of acres is, is developed, another number of acres is protected under conservation and that's the typical model we saw sometimes it's within the property sometimes it's somewhere else and as has been mentioned other times it's through a fee so um, that a, a developer might pay into a fund that the county would then use to go out and acquire property so those are um, when you look nationwide which is what we were asked to do um, the typical mitigation model approaches but again, that's um, only one small piece of the picture, right? Because um, when communities do a, a land system, a food system planning um, package, they're looking not only at mitigation during subdivision, but all the other um, incentives. They bundle everything together. Um, I'm going to come back to this B idea in just a second here. Uh, the, the next task we had was to report on uh, the incentives that we see used around the country. And we broke them into a couple categories. Incentives that keep egg lands in production and incentives that uh, protect egg lands during development. And um, Jim sort of broke them down in a similar way. So I wanted to talk very briefly about a couple of the ideas so that I'm not um, being too repetitive. One is the tax incentives. And here we saw um, potential for things to happen specific to Missoula County in the, in the area of how agricultural lands are defined. So gentlemen in the back said, I have a two acre apple orchard. Do I qualify? Probably not. But that's a good point. Um, if the definition of what counts as agricultural land in the state could accommodate the smaller truck farm um, idea that's being generated in this county, it could be of great benefit um, to landowners in addition to the traditional de definition. Thank you. So that's, um, I think, something that didn't come up yet that we found really uh, a great potential is to modify that definition to account for smaller sizes of agricultural operations in this particular county. Um, another idea that we thought was interesting what, are to create agricultural protection areas. Uh, we found these used throughout the country by um, can, different landowners who want to stay in agriculture they create these protection areas and they get certain incentives for doing it. Maybe it's tax breaks, maybe it's special services from the county, um, but we thought that was another interesting idea. I want to make sure I have time for this banking of development rights, which was mentioned very briefly by Jim, but here I, I'm trying to think of ways that the law could be helpful in um, getting the city to support
support the rural agriculture, which is a theme that came up tonight. So one of the ideas we saw was to actually have some kind of bank or development rights transfer where if someone put their land in a conservation easement because they want to continue being an egg operator, they get paid to do that. And then later, if a developer in the urban area wants more dense buildings that can go up higher, that developer buys those particular rights and gets to build higher or more compacted within the urban setting. And it's, so it's a way to keep the countryside um, more open to agriculture and other uses, pushing the density in more into the urban core. Um, I think I'm gonna leave that there. Um, another idea that um, would focus on how to get the urban area to support um, agricultural operators would be in, in the area of levies. And we noticed when we looked at um, the county's legal authority to assess levies that they have authority to assess levies for agricultural education and outreach and support. And so maybe some of the support programs being proposed could be funded in that way and or some levies could be designed to not be assessed um, on egg operators. So there might be a way to use some local levies to raise funds. And Vicki will get, Vicki Watson will get an extra levy on her, she offered, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so those are some um, things that I think are kind of new that haven't been covered that um, speak to some of the ideas raised today. A couple of other things I would highlight. Um, one is during subdivision review, what we noticed is that it was very typical for places to have actual criteria, that these are the things that we think um, need to be considered to determine whether there's been an impact or will be an impact, so that it's very clear. And this is the data that the developer needs to submit for this site, and that that's a very helpful um, feature that we saw as well. Another feature that we saw with incentives when we called planners from different places around the country that are having success in protecting egg is that they had listening sessions with the egg operators to ask them what is it you most need to stay in operation. So maybe it's help getting water on the field or not taxing my wetland or thing, you know, things of that nature. The listening sessions help decide what the incentives and support programs will be. And so those are some of the, I think, highlights of things we found um, particularly helpful. And uh, in conclusion, I would just say again that we've got an, a very unique law in Montana telling us what we need to do, but the law can only do one piece of it. It really takes the community and the incentives packages as well. Thank you. I'll start, uh, start one thing that was thrown up there on the board and I didn't get an explanation. At least I didn't hear exactly what is an agricultural plan development. And it was mentioned in two of the presentations. Uh, most recently, the one we just saw. Yeah, so if you'd be, if you could explain that, that would be great. So um, an agricultural plan community is, uh, someone else called it a, kind of like agroverbia, but um, 
It's a community that it, in the lot layout is designed to incorporate agriculture into the, the site design so that the open areas are often um, laid out in production fields and um, there might even be produce stands built into the design of the property. Uh, the covenants would talk a lot about um, how the, the common areas would be used for agriculture and they would sort of be designed to be, you know, like we have horse equestrian subdivisions and golf subdivisions. This would be the egg counter part of that. And, and um, the way it could be an incentive is that if you came in as a developer and designed it to promote agriculture, you would get particular things, perks, like bonus density or maybe certain fees waived or things of that nature. Other clarifying questions? John, is there one? Sure. Uh, I think this is a, this is a Okay. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Cusker and the Open Lands Committee. Um, clarifying as much as it is just um, further information, you mentioned uh, mitigation ratios and that the minimum you saw was one to one. Can you recall that average? When we looked at the uh, at the practices, uh, which were uh, were actually in use uh, throughout the country, uh, invariably, uh, I can't think of any that, that did not use a minimum mitigation ratio of one to one. Uh, 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 Many of these uh, came from California, uh, where it was mentioned by uh, someone in the audience uh, a bit earlier. Uh, the agricultural land uh, has been gobbled up at a remarkable rate. Uh, does that answer your question? I think so. I can. So, so one to one is the minimum, and, and it's tough to maybe identify an average. Uh, it's, yeah, so one to one was the minimum. Uh, and uh, when uh, when the report uh, that I gave, the summary of that report that said that the specific ratio uh, should depend upon the value of the resource, uh, meaning that if you have extra special, extra special valuable agricultural land, uh, that perhaps the one-to-one -one ratio would not be sufficient. Uh, maybe it goes as high as two to one or three to one in jurisdictions that have this in use. <laughs> Thank you. Any other clarifying questions before? <coughs> there, was, there was mention of uh, TDRs, the transfers of development rights. And uh, again, I think that was mentioned in a couple, uh, but I think the OLC, uh, Mr. Cusker will probably address it uh, best. The, uh, are there any examples, or how many examples did you find where they are actually being used, uh, or have been used successfully, or even unsuccessfully, uh, around the country? I'm looking. Uh, it takes a second after you turn around. I'm looking around for Michelle. Is she still here? Oh, very good. Uh, <laughs> her report um, went in much more detail concerning the TDRs, and I think uh, it would be much better if she answered that question. Thank you, Jim. At the top of my head, I'd say a few dozen places um, have them in focused on agriculture. Um, some more successful than others. We, in our report, we talk about Montgomery County saving like 30% of their agriculture base just through TDRs alone. Um, Seattle King County is a, is a city county partnership um, where they are, like I mentioned before, pushing the density into the urban core and then the county gets lands protected. Um, and so those are a couple, uh, I think, more successful examples. Montana, not as many. We've got an example of one in Bozeman. It's 
not an egg protection one, it's a, a deer, white tail or mule, I can't remember which, protection area. Um, but I, what I think could be a modified version is the banking, which I mentioned before, where um, maybe you aren't um, so, so much, um, maybe you're selling um, those mitigation credits, so if, if a developer is told one to one, they can go to this bank and buy the one um, from the bank and then the um, egg operator doesn't have to get into the business of finding where to transfer it to. So Michelle, it looks like Viva might want to add to what's to the answer. Yeah, I would like to add, thank you. Um, we looked at many of these examples that uh, Michelle Mudd mentioned too. Um, and because my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that because most of our county is not zoned, that it would be extremely difficult to do a TDR program here because there's no actual development rights that could be quantified in that way. Um, and do the market for creating these is really difficult. Um, why, what we are proposing with CFAC is this idea that we would um, you know, identify these cornerstones where there would be protection uh, encouraged, which is similar to the idea of receiving areas in a TDR program. And yet, um, so there would be some kind of uh, incentive there to protect land in those cornerstone areas um, if you wanted to mitigate, but you could find uh, someone who was willing to have their development rates purchased, and that's why we think it would be create an incentive for people who want to see their land stay in agriculture um, be able to do so. I don't know if I explained that very well, but it's, it's sort of a modification because, um, and what it does is it allows the community to plan for where do we want to see agriculture continue to occur. Um, and then in some cases, when it's a really small subdivision, they could just put money into a fund that would be used like the bank, for, and that could be then accumulated to, uh, to, um, to purchase development rights in the future. Other questions? Neva, while you still have the microphone, towards the end of your presentation, you were about ready to describe what appeared to be a, an example of your work with CFAC and how working with the developer led to a positive outcome for, for both parties, you know, for the community as, as well as the developer. Can you share a little bit with that? I, I would that? love to. Thanks, but um, I'll just do it briefly. Um, okay. <laughs> This is um, the short version of a story that, um, yeah, can you it's towards the end. Um, the, grab this, it's out of my bag. Um, the, the development was a proposal which you all, pro I, many of you probably saw, was Blue Heron Estates. And the developer came in originally um, to and proposed uh, the division of 75 acres of land into um, 15, no, into five acre lots with each one getting a residential, a residence on it. Um, and this land is located um, out in the Grass Valley. This is a slough um, off of the river. Um, and this was the original proposal, a classic uh, approach. Um, um, I, just, I want to get the numbers right. Um, but basically, uh, so it was 75 acres of agricultural soils. That's what the red is, is the prime agricultural soils. And many of the uh, acres adjacent to the slough are also really quite uh, quality soils, but just because they're in the 100 year floodplain, um, they weren't uh, included in that. So then, um, basically, the you know, CFAC reviewed this, looked at it, and recommended that it be denied. And um, in the process, the uh, open, uh, the 
Office of, sorry, get tired. The Office of Planning and Grants uh, encouraged the developer to sit down with us and with the Audubon Society, which um, also was concerned about the bird and wildlife habitat along the slough, um, to come up with an option uh, as a solution. And as a result, what um, this was the final, you know, outcome was a compromise. The developer still got their 15 lots, um, and so these are shown up here at the top. Um, this uh, piece in the middle is an agricultural parcel that is protected, um, and then the blue at the bottom is a common area for people in the uh, development to use um, and, and enjoy the wildlife habitat out there. So it was a great example of people working together, the land got protected, the habitat got protected, the homeowners got open space, and the developer still got uh, 15 lots out of it. And I um, believe the, so the, the part that was actually developed ended up being 20 acres in the egg and common area of the remainder. So the, um, the ratio, if you go back to this idea of the ratio, is that um, ended up being 1.6 acres protected for agriculture to uh, one acre developed. Um, and then if you added in the common area to that as well, it, it, the ratio went up. But it gives you an example. We could actually do it now, but then you want a predictable process so that it, it addresses each subdivision. Um, anyway. It is time. I want to make sure that we're, we're holding the public a half hour extra. Can you be your last question? Sir? Okay. And I just want to ask you guys. Yes, you do. Go ahead. Okay. Please. I mean, you are the boss. <laughs> Uh, Jim Cusker, uh, you mentioned quickly uh, in your discussion or your other uh, that it was advisable to separate agricultural mitigation from uh, natural resource, and I'm wondering why. <clears throat> well, the way as I mentioned in that summary slide. Uh, the Open Lands Committee, uh, as uh, as they reviewed all of these options, um, the incentive options as well as the uh, mitigation principles and guidelines, uh, felt that uh, these options uh, would work uh, very well, not just for agriculture, but for natural resources as well. Uh, and uh, the comment to which you're referring, uh, the stacking of those, uh, it would be rather difficult, perhaps, uh, to set land aside and say it is for both uh, because of the conflict of interest that might be involved. Uh, and so that was just kind of a, uh, a, a, a warning uh, if there are distinctly different uh, resources that are to be mitigated, uh, that it's going in a way so that, that each is protected. So you're not, you're not saying that having mitigation plans and policies for natural resource are a bad thing, but you don't try to find both of them on the same piece of property? Perhaps. It would depend uh, certainly on the size of the property, uh, because it uh, was uh, indicated by, uh, by uh, Jim Brown uh, earlier, um, much ag land is, that is protected also and protects wildlife. So it would definitely depend upon the size of the uh, land being considered. But we're, we're talking about land that isn't ag, but would be natural resource. That's right. So you're you're not saying that you're, it's okay to have a policy that addresses mitigation for natural resources, but just don't try and mix them together. Under right. uh, under particular circumstances, uh, where there might be a conflict of interest, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. And Jim, you said that was a caution. It's not an absolute. It's a caution. Think about. You, you would remember uh, that uh, all of the options uh, that uh, the Open Lands Committee presented are options.
Well, then I've been asked by staff um, to kind of affirm with you guys if it's all right that they do, um, we've got verbatim of everything that's happened. And by the way, the Valley County Planning Board is here filming you as well. So um, we've got the MCAT film, and they'll summarize the comments, the staff will, including the written form that people have available to them. And they would like to bring that summary back to you. And they also would like to start thinking about some options just as a first cut to start thinking about those things. It would be transparent and be able people can hear them. Is that okay with you? Do us have to do that? Okay, all right. And then the second thing I was supposed to do is offer you some dates for a meeting. And uh, our options appear to be October 16th, the regular planning board meeting, or set a special meeting, which probably would be September 13th. So, do you do that tonight? Or? Well, uh, setting a uh, regular an agenda on the regular scheduled meeting, uh, we don't normally set our agendas. We are given our agendas, and that comes from uh, Office of Planning and Grants. Uh, so, if it's for a special meeting, I think we have a little more flexibility on, on, on agreeing to that. Uh, but I would defer to staff. I believe the, the meeting dates that you were given, not just the special meeting date, but the other one, is open at this point for this kind of discussion. It looks like everybody wants to do it on a regularly scheduled meeting. October 16th. Sounds great. Yeah, it's easier not to <laughs> We're outnumbered. <laughs> So we have uh, 30 minutes for public comments, and I have a person down here who came up to me at the end of the other comment and said, could I please be first? So I said, yes, yeah. what could I do? Look at his hat. How, how long do I have? Three minutes. Okay. Would you tell me if you would have Yep. I'll I have done. a solution and I want to get you. Okay. Yep. Hi. I, will, I might have to do this. That's fine. Now, hit me harder because I, I don't feel very good anymore. About 140, 150 years ago, my family moved to the Grass Valley, and that's not a medical term. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Brett Deshaw. Okay? They tell me the only people that were here before us were the natives. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds good. People moved here from California Somebody had to subdivide in order for you to move here. You move here and then you say, I don't want any more Californians moving here. Interesting. Okay. The state legislature said you must explore all incentives first before you move to mitigation. Mitigation is the lazy man's way. It's the easy solution. I hate the term mitigation because it denotes damages. It denotes I injured somebody. I have been feeding my military to keep us safe. I have been feeding our children. I have been feeding the poor because the poor can't feed themselves. I feed our universities so that we have technology, so that we can put a man on the moon. So you're at two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to know what I have. I'm sorry, when do I have? You're 30 half. seconds left. You have about 40 seconds. I'll give you 10. You'll give me 10 minutes? 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you said you have a solution, and you wanted to be sure you got to it. Right, I only need about 30 seconds for the solution. You're down to 30 guys. Okay, well, I'll get to it. The easy solution is, is to know uh, the federal government put in uh, CRP programs. CRP programs are designed so you don't plant, so they can uh, maintain uh, price settings. 
so ranchers don't go broke and walk off their farms like they did in the 1930s. If agricultural land is important to you, you need to negotiate with the farms and ranchers payments per acre on those ground that you feel valuable for Missoula County. If you cannot negotiate with that farmer, then those, loan, those grounds aren't as important as you thought they were in the first place. The rancher gets to hang on to his land, doesn't lose his uh, uh, ability to get full value for his investment. How many of you invest in Apple Computer? Went up 400 or 600% in four years. I don't know that. I don't know who has that. But by God, you can look in Frenchtown and you can see my assets. You know what they're worth. You can call any realtor. I need a return on my investment. I can't get it off the 150 cows that I raise. You want me to, don't say bullshit. I caught you. So, you, so I really appreciate you. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Well, I want to make sure you get to finish. But, but I will give him the time. time. I've yes. given him the time. But we're all kind of, kind of tired. And I just want to make sure that you don't get insulted, that you get to say what you need to say. Okay. That's basically what I have to say. I am a capitalist. I know that is a bad word in Missoula County. Doggone. <laughs> I have a degree in business finance from the Uni University of Montana. That's how I work with things. Thank you. You don't like what I have to say? That's fine. I have no problem with it. Thank you very much for waiting for the end of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, we have other hands up, and I'm going to take the hands of people who have not spoken yet. And I had two people whose hands went up over here, and they did it after he had asked for his turn. So what I would like to do, again, is remind us of the ground rules. Um, I would like you to be polite to your neighbors. You may disagree with them. If we have nothing but a hullabaloo here, it is no help to the planet for it. Okay? Well, I think I can be here. And then if you would give the microphone to this gentleman. Yeah, I still squeak. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for Professor Mudd. I perhaps misunderstood what you said about uh, encouraging developers to go up in the urban area. Um, it sounded to me like it was a penalty. Could you explain on that, please, uh, how you plan to encourage the developers to stay in the primary urban area? I think it's up to the planning board whether you want to do So, uh, in, in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, well, so. The reason is because I asked if you would not try to have dialogue with the with the presenters. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. That's know. okay. That's all right. Thank Maybe you. if you I'm ask. Just asking them. for clarification. Okay. Would you bring the? Would you say the question again? Uh, it sounded to me like the microphone. Like it. It sounded to me like the uh, banking or the exchange that was presented by the law clinic uh, penalized developers when they went up in the urban area, as opposed to rewarding them. And I'm seeking clarification. Okay, I'm going to take that as a rhetorical question, and <laughs> Professor Mudd would use that as something she needs to look into. So we don't open the dialogue, okay? Whatever. So if you would give the microphone to the gentleman in the turquoise shirt. Thank you for your question. My name is Ed Taylor. I live in the Target Range area. Uh, I'm not going to take this personal at all because I, I, there's a lot of fear in the room tonight, it seems like. And, I think I just wanted to comment to the board that I appreciate the opportunity that you have given us all here tonight to receive these summary presentations. Uh, but I would like to ask the board as a whole a question. And I'm just curious of two things. Um, one, when were you folks presented this packet of information in its entirety? And two, if it's okay with you, I'd like to see a show of hands who have read the complete packet of information. I'll speak, I'll speak to the board. Uh, we received this complete, complete package 
uh, roughly a week, week and a half ago. Uh, and uh, I haven't read through every page. I've read, I've gone through all of it, but uh, uh, more than just looking at pictures. But I certainly didn't take it into great depth yet. But I can assure you that we will be gone through in great depth going forward. Uh, the, the only other comment, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. Uh, I, I do believe that you guys have a daunting task in front of you. And I think the most important, obviously, is to get some kind of continuity uh, for the development people and the agricultural people so we all know what to expect in the future so these little arguments and stuff don't take place. Thank you. Or big arguments. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Which are all valid. I, I should point out too that uh, in addition to getting these packages, we have had over the past few months uh, some uh, early exposure presentations of, of in progress of the various committees. Not all of them, but a few of them. Uh, but we're, we're new in this process. And I said that going into it. So these are all online also, right. so everybody can read them. If you want a hard copy, they will. you can buy them at the plant or at the uh, Office of Rural Initiative. And that doesn't mean like, oh, we're out selling them. It's just that they've got to pay the $2 to print them off. So it's like two bucks or that kind of thing. But they're available to everybody. OK, please. My name's Valerie Saney. I live in Victor, Montana, and my family has been farming since colonial South Carolina, and no, we didn't have slaves. They raised tea and cotton and everything else. Number one, I would like to address this as an option that perhaps we're looking as a, at a patient that we believe has a sickness. And if we were in a medical environment, we would be looking to treat a number of things. I believe what you're doing with your agricultural food supply is we're attempting to solve the symptom at the end. I believe that you have a patient that's presented itself to you and you believe that if you put a cast on its arm, you may in fact help to resolve its coronary arrest. There are a lot of things going on here. By doing what we're doing with land control, you will not still allow a farmer to be able to sell enough food at the farmer's market to make a living. Am I right about that? You ain't gonna make a living at the farmer's market. Number two, until we have food processing here, you're done. Right now, all of your food goes away because future commissioner, I can tell you of five food processing plants that left here, looked at a very good opportunity to bring viable good jobs here, and said, Missoula, you're too hard to do business with. Okay? They left, and they're in Idaho and North Dakota. I think that's called green jobs. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. The third thing I'd like to point out to you is that until and until we do something about stopping our federal government from allowing food to come in from all over God knows where with not one single regulation on it, that if you read the news today, you found out that we can't even make China run tests on chicken jerky for your dogs. Until we make a change in that agricultural policy, it does not matter what you do, what you do, everything that we try and do here is going to be for moot point. And if you think we don't have a problem, we got a bigger one. We're trying to put a cast on a broken arm and we're having a coronary arrest. Thank you very much. Well, if, if we're going to keep doing the public comments, I'm not going to do it for, we're not going to do it for applause. I asked you at the beginning, do you know the ground rules? I thought I would have clapped for it. I thought we would clap for a number of the people here. But I don't want to create a big basketball game going on with one side or the other. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maureen Edwards, and I uh, live on the Old Flynn Ranch, directly west of Missoula. About 15 years ago, my brother and sisters and I decided to put a conservation easement on the central core of the ranch because we wanted to preserve it for agricultural and historic uses. And we thought at the time that 
it would be an easy thing to do to protect the land. You know, we're just going to keep it. We're just going to save it. It has been so difficult and so expensive. And so I'm really glad to see that we're beginning to open up our ideas that uh, preservation isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I'm glad to see it happening, in, you know, at least the discussions coming in the county. I think right now the social and the government ways of looking at land use is, is geared heavily toward development. And it, it has hurt us in a lot of ways. And I want to give just two examples so that you understand um, why we really do need to have this discussion. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the sewer was put on the Mullen Road. And Marsh will tell you, she told you how much everybody was required to pay. Now, thank God, I know you don't like conservation easements, thank God we had it because we could not have afforded the taxes and we would have lost the land. Um, but what happened is uh, there were people there, ones that want to sell their land, that's great, you know, because eventually they'll make their money, I think, hopefully. It's a long ways coming, though. But there are people who did not want to sell their land who wanted to keep it, so I called the commissioners and I said, you know, this is forcing some of the farmers to sell their land. and. My, the response was, yes, we discussed that and we're okay with that. You know, development's going out the way of Mullen Road. People might as well just get used to it. And so this is an attitude I want to see changed. We do want to, we want to preserve our land. We want to protect it, but it's really hard when development seems to be the prior issue. And I'm, I'm just glad that we're talking about preservation as well as development. Thank you very much. I've got two hands, I have three hands over here, people that haven't spoken yet. And we have 17 minutes to go. I'll be quick. Um, hi, my name is Stephanie LaFort-Cox. I live uh, at 2009 South 8th Street West in Missoula. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank you and for everybody else who's come out here, spent all this time tonight to talk and have this discussion, because it's a discussion that we need to have. It's important. and. What I've learned the most from this conversation that we've been having is that we're not all that far off. Everybody agrees that you know we need to have things like processing facilities in Missoula. We need to have a better food economy. We need to have a stronger local food system. Those things all need to happen, but if we want to have a strong local food system, we have to have land to grow the food on. Um, it's, it, you know, we, I like the fact that I can buy local chicken turkey things from, I don't know what they're called, but the treats I give my cat, I can get them locally. It's awesome. I don't have to buy it from China because we have local agricultural land in Montana. If the land's gone, we're relying on those international systems. Um, I did some interesting calculation when Neva had her numbers up about the farmland loss that they calculated in the, the report. I was born in 1986. That's the year that they started oh using averages for it. Um, <laughs> I, I have a lot of future in front of me. I have dirty hands right now. I spend my day in the dirt. I want to do it for the rest of my life. Um, but since the day that I was born, on average, we've lost three football fields of agricultural land in Missoula every single day of my life. I want to see that trend stopped. Um, and I thank you for finally taking up this charge and getting onto that because local food feeds us. And we can't have local food without local farmland. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is Ken Jenkins. I would like to thank the planning board for taking this on. It's a complicated subject. I um, just have a couple quick things to say. Um, one is about fairness, and I hope that's considered. Um, you can have two farmers side by side, and uh, one of them is provided incentives to uh, retain the ag land and maybe the farmer next to him decides to do a subdivision and that farmer is penalized. At the end of the day if the goal is to preserve the ag land how can you compensate one person and take away from another? Um, taking a man's land is as un-American as anything I can think of. Second thing I'd like to say is if we're going to compensate if we're going to provide incentives. It's going to take money. Um, it takes money out of the tax base and it increases the need for tax dollars. And um, both sides of the issue are pretty well represented here tonight. And the, the people that aren't well represented here are 
the general public, the people that own the land that are going to be affected by this. People don't pay attention to any of this stuff until it happens to them. And I think this, one way or another, needs to get on the ballot for the public. If, if saving ag land is important to the public, it's going to cost money and should be on the ballot, then we'll find out how, how important it really is to the public. The, 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 the two sides of the special interest groups that are so well represented here tonight aren't representative necessarily of the general public that will be most affected by this. It affects housing affordability, it'll affect the tax base, uh, it'll affect the taxes that we pay. Um, you know, potentially what comes out of this could have huge impacts on the public, and they're not here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Vanderheiden. I'm a member of the Open Lands Committee, and I've participated in the discussions to date. I'm here tonight as a landowner and a resident of Potomac. I believe the county is at a critical juncture and has before it an opportunity to take a stand in support of our community's agricultural heritage for the benefit of our children's children. Agricultural land is a finite resource. Once it's gone, we can't get it back. Ag lands are some of the last vestiges of large contiguous private lands that provide landscape scale benefits for our wild and human communities alike, and it has shaped our community and values. I agree with the realtors that agriculture should not be discussed for the first time at subdivision hearings. That's what makes the creation of an agricultural policy more timely and important today. Development is important for our region to thrive. We are lucky to live here and others should have that opportunity, but it doesn't have to happen at the expense of the little critical ag land remaining in the county. The plethora of tools an ag policy could provide, such as the banking of development rights, can ensure that we can meet the needs of both agriculture and development in our county instead of working at cross purposes. Many other county, states, and countries, as we've heard, have successfully planned to maintain a high quality of life that is economically diverse and honors the role and needs of agriculture. I'm confident that we too can create ag policies that meet the goal of ag preservation within a framework that is socially acceptable. I strongly support the development of an ag policy for Missoula County that includes both incentives and mitigation measures. For as research, research shows, incentives alone are not enough to assure the future of ag lands for our community. I'm really excited that you guys have offered this opportunity for everybody to talk and I'm hearing a lot of really great ideas and I hope it continues. Thank you. Josh, I have to go over here because I have to, I can't. I'll wait. I'll wait. You would just be a pet if I picked you. Okay. Okay. <coughs> My name is Gene Milstead, and I'm a, I've been a long time uh, Missoula resident, and uh, I'm one of those nasty builder developers that live in Missoula, built housing. But, well, a um, couple of things that I would like the board to take into consideration and some of the comments I've heard tonight, um, and probably the one that's come up the most is bit of the banking of the development rights. And um, some of the people, at least I know there's one person on the board that has been through the process with the city and incentivizing um, the developers with rights, and it was uh, when uh, we were being uh, given incentives, density incentives to ex extend city sewer into certain areas. And if you, uh, <clears throat> what we have seen in the past is that when, if you bank, like if I was to bank um, these rights and try to put them somewhere else, um, then I'm going to have to fight with the neighborhood where I want to go because they're not going to want those incentives put and that particular piece of ground. And that's what's happened to us a lot. And that's why the incentive for extending sewers was demolished because the neighborhoods um, um, just got too mad about it and the city finally had to get rid of it because they were pissing everyone off. So, so don't, don't do incentives or banking and things like that. 
and not look at the other side and understand the history of the past of what's already happened in Missoula. Because there's a long, long history with um, the neighborhood associations being you know, very active in Missoula. And uh, you might say, well, yeah, you can go use them over there, but when you go over there, you can't. And another good example of that is when the city extended the sewer down 3rd Street and wanted to increase uh, density along the road, and all then the neighborhood didn't want it. So, um, and another thing that I would like to see is that when you do a presentation up here and you show, and they're saying that this is a cooperative e uh, effort on a subdivision, I would like to hear the landowners um, side of that because I've been in that situation. It said it's been as cooperative and it's not really. Thank you. So um, there, there's been a request to kind of do a clarification on the thing that's up here. And I'm going to do that at the very end at 930. Um, but, but what I don't want to, if we, if we are reaching a point where we're starting to kind of evaluate among us the possible options, I think that's another meeting. That's a time when the planning board and the staff would like to see you do that kind of thing. But I would like to ask if there are any other comments that would sort of, like Jean just did, be cautionary about this, et cetera, um, so we don't get into the back and forth about what was cooperative or what wasn't, et cetera. Um, I've got time for like three more. Okay. You're welcome. Um, my name is Gloria Rohr. My husband and I have a ranch in Greeno. And we only found out about this whole process the first of the year. And I understand it was going on for two years. Every uh, rancher, every landowner should have been notified of it. Um, the open land board is not balanced. I, I say it's more pro-environmental than, uh, you know, those that choose not to take easements on their property or want easements. Um, we don't know very little. I know nothing about anybody on the planning board, how much land you own, what you do for a living. I know Jerry, he lives down the road from us, but I really don't know much about Jerry at all. And I think somebody needs to come in and make a presentation about conservation easements and what the unintended consequences are of them. Not just uh, a study from the law school, but somebody who can tell you that conservation easements can be bought by other groups, other entities, uh, that a conservation easement takes away your private property rights and what all the ramifications of conservation easements are. Uh, and dangling money like a carrot uh, over a rancher who might be having some hardship, I think is very poor indeed because agriculture is the mainstay of this nation and founded, this na founded by this nation. Our constitutional rights are being violated. So I'd like to, these people to introduce themselves, tell us how much land they own and what they do for a living and if they're retired, what they did when they weren't retired. Thank you. I looked at, at your name thing and I knew your name wasn't Mark Grady. <laughs> Thank you for that. I don't have a I'm you. So, so I'm not going to get into all of that tonight. We only have five minutes to go. Okay. All right, but um, I'm, I'm coming. The other thing is that the planning board, back, that who they are and that kind of business, you can find out some of that online as well. I'm not trying to shut you down. I yeah, only have time for two more. Don't have to it. True. True. I'm sorry to make that assumption. I'm John Flohar. I live out in Potomac. We have my two sisters and I have a small ranch out there that um, we kind of inherited. We just paid it off about two years ago. And I told my sisters in the beginning I'd give it 10 years and I'd give it my best effort. And at the end of 10 years, if I couldn't make a living there, we'd subdivide it and we could all three retire. Well, the, the 10 years is up, and I've put my own money into the ranch every year, 
et cetera, last year. And this year I'm gonna have to put, depending on the cattle market, but um, it's looking like I'll have to put more of my own money in there again. But I like to deal in facts rather than um, some nostalgia of a truck farm and a, what do they call it, um, where you buy fresh farmer's market. farmer's market of a year gone by. Um, we don't have farmer's markets. We should, there's, there's basically, it's, it's, it's a non-factor. In fact, we use less than 1% of the food that's consumed in Missoula County is purchased from a local grower. The other 99% is purchased at Walmart and Safeway. So um, as far as mitigation for um, subdivision, it's, it's pointless because the very government that is swearing to protect the farmland in 2010 shut the water off to the Central Valley of California, dried up thousands of acres of orchards and farmland, forcing fifth generation growers to stack their orchards with excavators and burn them. Now today, in California, there's a 12% unemployment rate, and the farmers are having trouble finding workers to get the crops out of the field. 12% unemployment, finding, <laughs> hard time finding workers. Okay, now as far as the mitigation and all of the land, and just leave us alone. I don't want any government doing anything with the land that we own. If you want land, buy the Broken O Ranch in Fairfield. There's a better climate. There's more irrigated acres there on that one ranch than the entire Missoula Valley combined. Yeah. All the water you can use, all the land you can ever farm, and every person in here that wants to be a farmer could have their own center pivot. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm going to take one last comment over here, and uh, and then we'll close. It'll be 9:30. Uh, I said I'm here till midnight, but I'm really tired. <laughs> you haven't been to very many of these meetings then. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> My name is John Richards, and I just have a couple of questions for the planning board to consider. If somebody wanted to come in to mitigate where your house was built and said, we want a one-to-one -one minimum ratio, and they took a chainsaw and cut your house in half and took it, do you think you'd stand still or do you think you'd have an argument and squawk? I think you guys need to really consider what's going on here. You're talking about taking people's land without any compensation. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll take it as long as it's not a rebuttal. Okay, all right, you're gonna do a nice close, we're gonna finish. You know, I have seven children, I have to go to bed at night when it's really nice. So, here you are. Thanks. Last one, that was such a nice short comment. Um, my name is Annie Heiser, I'm here with the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, and I just wanna ask um, you to consider one more thing that I'm a little surprised didn't come up in the discussion so far as much as I kind of thought it would, which is private property rights. Because private property rights is something that's really important to me, and I would assume is probably something that's really important to a lot of people in this room. And I think what I would ask you to consider is what we mean when we think about private property rights. Because, you know, a lot of times in the news what we hear about is, is people who believe that private property rights give you the right to do absolutely whatever you want to do on your land. And unfortunately, or fortunately, that's just not the way that we as a nation have decided over and over again over time that that's what property rights mean. Property rights means that I have the right to do whatever I want on my land so long as it doesn't impact the ability of other people to use their land. And private property rights means a lot of other things. It means, you know, understanding, respecting that there's local knowledge, See, uh, recognizing the importance of individual responsibility and accountability recognizing the need for personal prosperity and financial stability, and those are all things that can be addressed by the options that have been raised tonight. My, to me, the thing that would have the greatest negative impact on our private property rights in this county would be doing nothing or not doing enough to preserve agriculture in Missoula County, to, preserve, to protect the future of agriculture in Missoula County. 
Because let's think about this. Right now, most people in this county are planning on selling their land at some point. And that's completely understandable. And I think, you know, to many people, like many people mentioned already tonight, their land is their retirement. And that is completely understandable, and, and I appreciate that. But what that means for the rest of us is that at some point, all of, if all of those people end up developing their land, there won't be enough agricultural land left in Missoula County to maintain a viable agricultural economy. It means that if we don't create some real safeguards right now to make sure that there's enough agricultural land around, we're not gonna have enough producers to keep a tractor dealership or meat processors or food distributors, and we've lost a lot of those already, but we're gonna close the door on future economic opportunities if we don't have the land. So the real impact on private property rights here, my last thing, would be allowing some people to develop their land however they want to do it without considering the massive negative impacts that that will have on all the other landowners who want to maintain their private property rights to use their land for farming. So that's what these policies are about, thinking about the future of farming. And thanks so much for all you're doing and we hope you can get to it. Thanks. Thank you. So. <clears throat> But you said you haven't done very many of these meetings. I, I'm thinking about the fact that I've lived here a long time, and I, it's, if I was somebody from somewhere else and I heard all these comments, I, I have a hard time thinking about who I disagree with. Because all of these things are interests that people have, and they're all part of your lives, no matter who you are. What's happened now is we're down to values, and values are harder to deal with and creating policy. So I think these guys have a heck of a job to do. And I wanna, Bob, you wanna do a real quick clarification and then I'm closing it because they have a little business meeting they have to finish. I represent the, I'm, I'm the real estate agent that represents this property. This is what I know about this property. The uh, FEMA came in and changed the floodplain and took all of this that was once geared toward residential and turned it into floodplain. There's a spot here for a building right about here, a house. It's the only high spot on that knob that actually falls pretty much out of the floodplain. This was a riparian area that we had discussed possibly taking and, and doing something with to protect the wildlife and the waterfowl that are in that area. As for the Audubon wishes, no issue there. But to be honest with you, this would not have ever been a negotiation with CFAC if we didn't have any other opportunity to do something different with it. But once it became floodplain, uh, we didn't have any other options, so. Thank you. So our, our, what I'd like to have you do is, uh, I don't care who you're sitting next to, would you turn to the person on your left and turn to the person on your right and shake their hand and tell them thank you tonight? Thank <laughs> you.